This is Gary Momba. I'm the director of the Maritime Archaeology Trust, and I'm here today to introduce you to our annual lecture series, Maritime Archaeology in Depth. Now, if you like the vibe, subscribe. And if you rate, donate. And you can do that through Facebook or our website, and the link is below in the description. Hi, I'm Julie Satchel, and today I'm going to be looking at three decades in depth. Looking back over the presentations given for the Trust's previous anniversary years, I was really trying to come up with some ways to demonstrate some of our key areas of work. Um, and I've come up with a theme of MATs A to Z of shipwrecks. Obviously, A to Z gives 26 potential wrecks. Um, and wanting to get to 30 for our 30 years, I've taken the liberty of adding MATs at the start. Using an alphabetical approach has been slightly challenging as it's surprising how many of the sites that we've investigated over the years actually start with the same letter. But I hope I've chosen a selection which showcase and celebrate the diversity of our work. The sites aren't in chronological order. So for those of you who have been following us for 30 years, look out for some old favourites um, as well as some more recent work. So if you're sitting comfortably, we'll be, we will begin what will be a rapid voyage through 30 wrecks for 30 years. M is for the Medina, which leads us into the forgotten wrecks of the First World War project. The Medina is just one of over 1100 wrecks included within the data set, which covers just the south coast of England and was investigated between 2014 and 2018 to coincide with the centenary of the war. The Medina has a fascinating history, being regarded as one of the best passenger liners of its time. It served as the Royal Yacht before starting its intended regular route, carrying mail, passengers and general cargo between London, India and Australia. It was sunk off the Devon coast in 1917 and lies in 60 metres of water. It was carrying a cargo which included the possessions of the retiring Viceroy of India. You can read more in reports and view images of artefacts through the Forgotten Wrecks online interactive viewer, our unique and innovative way to explore the large marine data set. A is for the Allen Bay Wrecks. These sites have been very much part of the MAT's journey from the earliest work on the sites in the early 1990s through to continuing ongoing monitoring. Two shipwrecks, one a section of the Pomone which wrecked on the Needles in 1811 and another thought to be a local trading craft from the early 19th century, have been subject to survey, sampling, excavation and analysis. Lying in only seven metres of water, these shallow sites have been perfect for involving and training volunteers, hundreds of whom have been involved and whose contribution to all aspects of our work is much appreciated. We have also set up a diver trail in the bay which trailed a range of different underwater stations and guide options. You can read all about these experiences and the wrecks in the 2014 publication, which forms volume two of the MAT's own monograph series. T is for the train set wreck. This site was discovered by Dave Wendes, dive skipper of our regular dive boat White Spirit, who we have been working with for more than 20 of our 30 years. MAT has deployed its high resolution underwater cameras to capture photogrammetry from the site and develop this fantastic 3D model, which clearly shows elements of the 1860s train set that was being transported to Denmark on this 19th century schooner. S is for the Stirling Castle, where MAT has used its experience with maritime archaeological archives to undertake assessment and analysis work that has led to the publication of the site as volume four within our monograph series. This highly significant wreck was a 70 gun ship which was lost in the great storm of 1703 on the Goodwood Sands of Kent. The archive spanned over 30 years of work and was dispersed between organisations, individuals and museums. The project was only possible through working with past and present members of the investigation teams and a large number of specialists and archive custodians, without whose support it wouldn't have been possible. With a large and complex archive, this wasn't a short term process, taking over a decade from the initial audit through to the publication. Now we start our alphabet run through with A for Arfon, which is the subject of one of MAT's first online diver trails, which launched in 2017 to mark the centenary of the loss of the vessel. The site is exceptionally well preserved as it was a requisitioned Admiralty trawler. It was discovered by Martin and Brian Jones, after which it was designated as a protected wreck due to its high levels of preservation. 
The dive trail lets you explore the history of the ship, its loss and its crew, as well as allowing you to fully explore the wreck from the comfort of your computer. B is for the Borgny. This Norwegian steamer lies in 33 metres of water south of the Needles. It sank in February 1918 when transporting a cargo of coal from Newport to Rouen. It was dived back in 2004 for a project called Oasis, which looked at marine species inhabiting historic shipwrecks. This was an early project to investigate the relationship between wrecks as reefs, providing natural habitats as well as their heritage value. These issues have grown in their importance and we are likely to explore these further during the current UN Decade of Ocean Science. C is for Caduceus, which was a wooden sailing bark built in Sunderland in 1857, the remains of which lie in the eastern Solent south of Hailing Island. This 411 tonne, 40 metre long ship wrecked in a heavy gale in 1881 while en route from Newcastle to Italy with coal. We surveyed the site in 2010 as part of the Archaeological Atlas of the Two Seas project, which was a major project working with French and Belgian colleagues to build common approaches to marine databases and fieldwork techniques. It showed the benefits of taking a partnership approach to heritage, which often spans modern borders and due to the mobile nature of ships is usually relevant to multiple nations. D is for D-Day's landing craft 2482 and its cargo of tanks and bulldozers. Also in the Eastern Solent and investigated in 2010, this was a collaboration with South Sea Sub Aqua Club and Historic England. The ship had been lost on the night of the 5th of June 1944 after breaking down with engine trouble en route to the D-Day landings in Normandy. The vessel was taken under tow but capsized spilling its cargo of tanks and armoured bulldozers into the sea. The ship was then sunk by gunfire so not to become a hazard to shipping. One of the aims of this work was to assess the sites for formal heritage protection. At that time, the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act was not being used for sites underwater. This project tested the application of this legislation in the marine zone, and we are pleased to say that the tanks and bulldozers have now been formally protected and that Historic England have since expanded the use of this form of protection for marine remains. E is for the Eleanor, one of our First World War casualties. It was part of the Merchant Fleet Auxiliary and was sunk while carrying a cargo of mines and depth charges, which would have been worth up to £63 million in today's prices. However, the real loss was that all bar one of the 35 crew on board didn't survive the wrecking. The sole survivor was Barton Hunter. There is an amazing story of his survival. This site highlights how our archaeological work on more recent wrecks can have particular significance for family members and descendants. We were delighted to be in contact with Jean Rudden, who is the surviving daughter of Barton Hunter. She allowed an archive of letters sent to her father to be digitised and was able to attend the end of project event and has since donated her father's uniform, which is on display at the Shipwreck Centre and Maritime Museum on the Isle of Wight. F is for the Flower of Yuji, wrecked in the Eastern Solent in 1852. It demonstrates the development of globalised trade and the role that one ship played within its lifetime. Between the 1830s and 1850s, it called at many ports around the world, including the Far East, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, Black Sea and across the Atlantic. Sometimes opportunistic voyages. These included transporting troops from India to China in support of the first opium wars, taking indentured labourers from India to Mauritius and taking German emigrants um, over to New York. Although flour is wrecked in the Solent, it is heritage that is relevant to many nations and is very much a global heritage asset. Not only have we published the results of the site, um, we also, it also features in an education pack for schools, which aims to get the next generation excited about shipwrecks. G is for the Galia, sunk by a submarine in October 1917, carrying a cargo of coal off the Isle of Wight. Diving on this site managed to experience the best visibility that the Trust have had in 30 years. As you can see on the right, much of the 91 metre long ship was visible. Whole site photogrammetry has allowed a fantastic 3D model to be created, shown on the left, and that's available for all to explore. H is for Hazardous. This is the Warship Hazardous, a designated protected wreck site off the West Sussex coast, which has been investigated by the locally based Hazardous project team since its discovery in 1977. A French ship launched in 1696. It was taken as a prize by the English and refitted. It was lost in 1706 in a storm after escorting a convoy across the Atlantic. 
MAT worked with the local team from 1996 and supported a number of initiatives that helped open up the site to audiences, including establishing the first underwater dive trail on a protected wreck site in England and the production of a popular publication. We undertook an archive audit and also an assessment of the dynamic environmental conditions which impact the site, making it one of England's most at risk. The hazardous project team continue to develop field work and research on this important site. I is for Invincible, the protected wreck of the warship which sank in the Eastern Solent in 1758. In 2008, we undertook a digitisation of the archive of investigations which took place in the 1980s. This included paper, drawn and photographic records. These were primarily held by John Bingaman with additional information from other project team members and the Chatham Historic Dockyard. It resulted in an online viewer through which it was possible for anyone to access information from this significant site, which has recently undergone further excavation. J is for the John Mitchell, a 25 metre long steam drifter that had been requisitioned by the Admiralty for use as a net vessel. It had sunk on the 14th of November 1917 following a collision. Lying at 40 metres, 12 miles southwest of the Needles, this deep site is out of reach for many. Not only did we create a 3D model and interactive tour of the wreck site, this was our first site for which we created a full virtual reality experience to bring the site alive. VR headsets come closest to being able to give non-divers a feel for the experience of diving, with the bonus of providing the impression of much better visibility than is usually found on sites. K is for the Curland, an 87 metre long steam trading vessel lost in December 1917. Diving on the site has shown evidence of the cargo, which includes rifles, horseshoes, wheels and tyres, which were being transported from New York to Calais. The brass builder's plate from the site has been on display at the shipwreck centre following discovery and identification of the site by Martin Woodward. This is another of the forgotten wrecks of the First World War shipwrecks that, due to the research of such a large number of ships across the south coast area, we, will be, we were able to develop understanding of the scale and rate of losses. As you can see here, Curland was one of the many losses from 1917, a period of unrestricted submarine warfare. L is for the Londonier, which was built in Hartlepool for a Belgian company, but was on charter to the French government when it was torpedoed south of the Isle of Wight by a submarine in March 1918. These cross-country links made the site perfect to form the central theme for an online trilingual education resource and programme that was part of the Archaeological Atlas of the Two Seas project. Children learnt about the ship's history and engaged with complex engineering themes using the evidence from the wreck site. M is for the Mendy, which sank off the Isle of Wight in February 1917 with the tragic loss of almost 650 lives of those on board. They were from the South African native labour contingent and were on their way to support the Western Front. The shipwreck centre holds artefacts from the site, which was located by Martin Woodward. During the Forgotten Wrecks project, we were fortunate to have the ship's bell on loan, during which time we created a 3D model which can be viewed online by anyone. This bell is now on display in South Africa. The site also features within a booklet on the contribution of black and Asian seamen in a range of roles during the war. The site and its artefacts show the continued relevance and significance of maritime archaeological material for a wide range of communities and show how shipwrecks can reveal these hidden histories. N is for the Needles, where a number of wrecks are protected within the designated area, including HMS Pomone, lost in 1811, and HMS Assurance, lost in 1753. Work on the Needles was one of the first projects supported by the Trust and has included diving, survey and geophysics including an early application of swath bathymetry, which resulted in a publication in 2000. We also attempted to set up a diver trail on site and have been ongoing monitoring for many years. We look forward to developing work using the Needles Archive as part of the new UMPATH project in coming years. O is for the ocean, the 20 metre long wooden remains of a sailing vessel exposed by storms in 2014 off the East Winner Bank. Investigations at this site were in response to a report by a member of the public, who are often an important source of information for us to follow up. The site shows how substantial sites can lie hidden in relatively shallow conditions. Research has subsequently shown the site to be that of the ocean, a schooner which was built in 1825 in Devon and lost in 1865 with a cargo of China clay. P is for Steam Pinnace 704, one of the collection of vessels that lie in Fortin Lake near Gosport. 
Between 2006 and 2008, we ran a project with the Nautical Archaeology Society to involve the local community in surveying hulks around the lake, which resulted in both popular and academic publications. We returned to Pinnace 704 during the Forgotten Wrecks project as the ship was commissioned for use during the war and launched in 1917. We created a 3D model of the site and turned this into an annotated tour, one of the features being the distinctive Yarrow water tube boiler. The model data means that ongoing changes to the site can now be easily monitored through repeat surveys. Q is for Qatar wrecks. Diving in clear water is a change from the usual Solent conditions, but it does allow for the rapid capture of digital data sets, several of which have generated more 3D models of sites and features, such as these wrecks of a sailing dhow and a metal barge. Over a number of seasons, we have worked with partners off Qatar to build understanding of maritime sites and to develop capacity. With maritime archaeology still being a developing discipline, we are pleased to be able to share our experience with others. R is for the Ribadeo Galleon. This site was part of the four sea discovery projects, which brought together partners to study the remains of Iberian shipwrecks from the 16th and 17th centuries. The ship was a Spanish galleon constructed in the 1590s to take part in the second Spanish Armada to invade England. After a failed expedition in 1597, the ship returned to Galicia, where the storm-damaged vessel entered the port of Ribadeo. It sank in shallow water close to the port, and so most of the valuable items were recovered at the time, and it's left to the wooden structure, which has, was buried under the sand. The project itself demonstrates the importance of working with international partners and research networks in the scientific study of ships. S is for the Southwestern. Built in 1874 as a mail ship for the London and Southwestern Rail Company, it sailed from Southampton to St. Marlo in March 1916 when it was sunk by a torpedo. Diving on the site has gathered data to be able to understand the extent of the physical remains. Sadly, 26 people were lost when the ship took just eight minutes to sink. As it was working out of Southampton, this included some local sailors. One of those lost from the Southwestern is commemorated on Southampton's Hollybrook Memorial, which commemorates those lost at sea from the land and air forces. The Trust's 3D model with annotated tour of the memorial has been created as part of the centenary work and allows anyone from around the world to view the site. T is for training ship Mercury, which was actually a shore-based establishment on the River Hamble, which trained boys for a life at sea and operated between 1885 and 1968. Since 2000, we have been investigating sites on the River Hamble, which is one of, has one of the largest collections of hulks in the country. Two such hulks are Flash and Fortuna, which were part of TS Mercury. They had structures built on their decks and were used for accommodation. We have used these sites for training volunteers and students in a range of survey techniques, so T could also really be for training. U is for U-boats. We have worked on a number of different U-boats and submarines, just two examples included here are the U-90 off the Isle of Wight, where detailed survey has created a record of the seabed remains, and the Penn Dennis U-boat collection, where our research has helped identify which of the U-boats were in which position. Submarines hold a particular fascination with the public, and we are pleased to currently have the Periscopes and Propellers project, which has increased our information available on these sites for all ages at the Shipwreck Centre. V is for V-44 and V-82, the remains of two German destroyers which were hiding in plain sight in Portsmouth Harbour. Drone survey of these sites, which lie in deep mud, produced 3D models. Both of these vessels were part of the German high seas fleet, with further research discovering that V-44 had been a veteran of the Battle of Jutland. Highly significant remains that without detailed study could re have remained unidentified. W is for War Night where our work has created a 3D model and tour of the rare remains of the steam turbine engine. This was the only merchant ship to have been fitted with one of these engines in our First World War data set. It was also one of the war prefix standard built vessels that the British government ordered to be produced to a particular specification due to the large number of losses. The loss of life during the sinking was significant with only 11 of the 47 crew surviving. We created a community for those lost within the Imperial War Museum's Lives of the First World War project, where it was possible to add photographs of some of those lost, highlighting the human story and helping commemorate them. X is for, well, this is where things got tricky with ship names. I have gone with X marks the spot, as you can't fail to wish that some of these treasure maps are accurate. 
We still often plot unidentified wrecks with an X on the chart while we investigate and try to identify them. And we have a couple of interesting unidentified sites that we hope to be able to present at next year's talk series. Y is for the Yarmouth Roads Protected Wreck Site, an important one for the Trust as we were formed following the Isle of Wight Maritime Heritage Project that excavated the wreck in the 1980s. It is thought to be the Santa Lucia, a Spanish merchant ship lost in 1567 bound for Flanders with wool. We undertook further analysis of timbers as part of the 4C discovery project, adding to understanding of the timber resources, but results not being able to tie down a date any further. MAT is the licensee for this significant site and continues to monitor its condition. And finally to Z and Zubian, a unique ship within the First World War data set. It was formed of the forward section of the Zulu, which had its stern blown off by a mine, and the rear section of the Nubian, which lost its bow to a torpedo. Zubian saw extensive service in the last two years of the war and was eventually scrapped. This is a story that mirrors our own. When the Isle of Wight Council and the Hampshire County Council realised 30 years ago that when two sides come together, it can make a strong and successful bond, which was the Hampshire and White Trust for Maritime Archaeology that became today's Maritime Archaeology Trust. There ends our brief run through of 30 wrecks for 30 years. I hope this has given a summary of the scope and impact of the Trust's work. Of course, we investigate much more than just shipwrecks and we will be hearing about those sites now. But to conclude, we are certainly looking forward to diving into the next 30 years of discovery. Thank you. Southampton, 1938. Rendezvous of ocean liners. Britain's premier passenger port. Gateway to the world a haven of tranquil efficiency with an infinite capacity for taking the strains imposed on her by visitors flooding in from both hemispheres. But when in 1939 the blast of war blew in her ears, Southampton, with a nascent energy, collected within her ocean gates a mighty stream of war material to aid the champions of democracy in their bitter fight against the monster of Nazism, let loose on a Europe trembling and unprepared. Southampton was at once a frontline port, a role not new to her as she'd played it so well in the last war. Since then, huge land reclamations and extensive additions to her docks had fitted her for the gigantic task on which she was now about to embark. Names carved onto a wall by soldiers heading into battle, some just initials, others with the city and state they were from. After D-Day, American troops lined the streets all the way up through Southampton into the Common and into Shirley. And while they were waiting to embark, they just inscribed their names and their hometowns, probably saw some others on the wall and wanted to add theirs. When you're putting your finger in the initials of the name of someone who carved that all those years ago and where they were going, it is quite emotional. You, and you're terrified you're going to miss someone's name. That's what I was thinking about today. All have survived the ravages of time and weather. Now they're being digitally preserved and efforts are underway to discover more about them. One was Kurt Hodges. He was 20 year old when he arrived in Southampton, having just finished high school, joined the army and came over. He went through France after the Battle of Normandy and into the Battle of the Bulge. Fortunately he survived the war and returned home to Chicago. This heritage lottery funded project is asking volunteers to help record and research the names. I really wanted to do something for the D-Day celebrations and to preserve something for future generations. This is a, a local part of history that may not be here in a few years time and it's my opportunity to give my time to help preserve that. Kurt Hodges lived until he was 93 but many of the men who carved their names here would never have made it home. Richard Jones, ITV News, Southampton. On recording days, volunteers helped to systematically record the wall brick by brick, taking detailed photographs and recording what they could see. It soon became apparent how much the visibility of these inscriptions varies in different weather conditions. In dry and bright conditions, the inscriptions almost disappear. They are most visible when the wall is wet and the sky is overcast. 
Volunteers were trained in basic digital SLR camera operation and in techniques such as photogrammetry and reflectance translucence imaging, RTI. Each of the close-up photographs in the viewer was selected from the best of those taken under different weather conditions. Many have been digitally enhanced to increase the visibility of the inscription by altering the highlights and shadows and filter or removing the colours. This simple process alone revealed parts of the inscriptions that were not visible to the eye. The 3D model of the wall was created with photogrammetry. This involved taking overlapping images at set heights and distances, which the software then processes into a 3D model. From the results of these recording sessions, a list of names and a schematic drawing was produced. The drawing makes it much easier to see the relationships between the inscribed bricks. The inscription left by Lawrence Mathis is deeply carved and takes up a full 11 bricks. It contains his full name, date and hometown. This would suggest he was here at the wall longer than some of the others, Andy Alam, for example, whose inscription consists only of their name, quickly scratched onto one or two bricks. These inscriptions were probably carved with their army knives. The majority include their first name or initials, surname, hometown and sometimes a date. A few others contain features such as anchors, or in Mayer's case, the outline of a landing craft. In some cases, arrows were used to link inscriptions. Each carving is completely unique in style and really does reflect the creator's handwriting. James Henley is an excellent example. The handwriting on his draft card matched his carving on the wall almost perfectly, ruling out other possible candidates for the same name. James dated his inscription and the same date occurs in several other inscriptions, suggesting that these men might have been from the same unit standing at the wall together. When researching James Henley, his army serial number was picked up on the passenger muster list for LST 262, which sailed from Southampton on Christmas Day 1944. The list records that he was sailing with the 449th Quartermaster's Gasoline Supply Company. By checking the names of the other inscriptions with the same date, we were able to confirm the identity of eight more men, all serving with the same unit of Quartermaster's. Several groups of men have been identified in a similar way using unit rosters. The wall has been known as the D-Day Wall because it was thought that these inscriptions belonged to men queuing here ready to embark on D-Day. In fact, these inscriptions represent US troops passing through the city from the lead up to D-Day all through the war and into early 1946. The majority were passing through here for the first time as replacements or as part of new divisions entering the war Others had participated in the D-Day invasions and were in Southampton to return for the second time after recovering from injuries. The US 9th Infantry Division had already fought in North Africa and Sicily and had returned to Winchester to prepare for the Normandy invasion. They embarked from Southampton to Utah Beach on the 7th of June. The earliest known inscription belongs to Sidney Greenwald. Although the inscription is not dated, Research has shown he landed in Normandy on D-Day plus 6, the 12th of June. This brick was saved from the demolished houses and is in the care of Southampton Museums. The latest inscription we can date, again from research rather than the brick itself, is Leander's Beale. Lee passed through Southampton in January 1946. Two of the most visible names on the wall belong to Kurt Hodges and William Muller. Deeply carved and next to each other, these inscriptions are almost as clear now as they were 76 years ago. The discovery of a roster allowed us to identify these two men as serving with the Wallow 6th Infantry Division. The inscriptions left by seven more men on the roster were later matched. John Curtis Hodges, or Kurt as he was known, was born in Texas and spent the latter half of his childhood in Illinois. Having learnt to drive and maintain vehicles in his father's taxi and bus business, He joined the army as a transport corporal in 1943, aged 18. He trained with the 106th Division at Camp Atterbury, Indiana, where he met William Muller and formed a friendship that would last until Kurt's death in 2017. William Muller was born in Yonkers, New York. Aged 18, he was at college as part of the Army's specialised training programme when he was enlisted in March 1943. Both Kurt and William survived the war, though Kurt's hearing was permanently damaged by the artillery and William suffered with leg conditions resulting from the cold. They kept in contact and attended reunions. Kurt returned to Chicago where he worked for the railroad and later drove Greyhound buses for 17 years. After a series of moves to Arizona, California and Utah, Kurt settled back in Texas in 2005. 
where he lived until he passed away in 2017, aged 93. William returned to New York and studied for a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. He joined the Grumman Corporation in New York, where he specialised in engineering design and held several senior positions. His achievements included the co-invention of the Lunar Module Alignment System, part of the Apollo Space Programme, and working on the F-4 Tomcat fighter plane. We were honoured to have corresponded several times with William before he died. He was fascinated to hear of the interest the bricks were attracting and to see photographs of it after all these years. In a telephone call in January 2020, he laughingly explained that he was nicknamed Wimpy after the Popeye character due to his man-sized appetite during the war. Sadly, William passed away in September 2020, aged 95. Calvert Richard Avery served as a field director with the American Red Cross. He was born in 1910 in Yonkers, New York. In 1930, Cal is recorded as working as a chemist's assistant for a research institute. In 1932, he marries Louise and by 1940, they have two children and are living at an orphanage in Trivoli, where Cal is superintendent. He was drafted in October 1940 as a field director with the Red Cross. They often recruited men with social care or education backgrounds who were deployed alongside military units to look after the welfare of the men from landing on the beaches on D-Day until the end of the war. Pastoral roles are seldom recorded in World War II histories. They wore an army uniform with Red Cross patches. Cal must have been in Southampton sometime after August 1944, although it has not been possible to determine which unit he was assigned to. It has also been hard to trace Cal after the war, but a 1956 newspaper article records his son's graduation. At that time, he was living at Annadale on the Hudson. Cal passed away in July 1987 at St Thomas in the Virgin Islands. As we've heard, volunteers have been a huge part of all aspects of this project, the research and the recording to helping with outreach events. Between April 2019 and December 2020, 75 volunteers have been involved, 57 of whom were new to the Trust. Some of our project volunteers have very kindly shared with us their thoughts on their volunteering experience and what it means to them to have been involved. I have been helping to decipher the inscriptions on the wall, um, looking at, at the, the names and then trying to identify them from their names on the wall and if they've put a date and maybe a state that they lived in and then going through the draft cards so volunteering by actually you know trying to identify the soldiers and then looking at their past history before the draft date where possible what happened to them after the war never assume that a strange name is the only name in the world they there are so many people with the same name and you have to double sometimes triple check as far as you can that the person that you've identified you think is family related is in fact family related i also uh, discovered about the thing about racial inequalities during the war too which i was not really aware of we are so used nowadays to having mixed culture, mixed racial opportunities. And I was shocked to see the things that had happened to the African-American soldiers who came over to England. I hadn't realised Southampton was so involved. Um, you know, you, you've seen the films and things, but Southampton's very rarely mentioned. I think I've enjoyed the most getting contact with the descendants of the military personnel. It only happened twice, um, but it was fascinating. Um, but it made such a difference to them, to know that there was something left of them, to think that some of their predecessors actually had left their mark in Southampton. I think I you know, almost sort of bored my family sick with telling them, oh my goodness, guess what I found out now. Especially under lockdown, it's been great having something sort of absolutely sort of, you know, really useful to do. Um, because when you're stuck at home, um, 
sort of, you know, to feel you're making a difference to somebody um, is, is, is pretty good. We have been able to tell the stories of 67 US soldiers from 29 different states. This has an enhanced understanding of the historical importance of the war. The online 3D interactive viewer means the graffiti, past research, photographs, historic documents and soldier stories are now accessible together to anyone and everyone with an internet connection. The viewer embodies how digital media is revolutionising how we can access, present and engage with heritage. The linked project resources, the booklet, education pack, walking tour, geocache, articles and this film all provide other ways for the wall and its stories to be enjoyed and will continue to be available via the project website. At the wall itself, we have installed a plaque to raise awareness of the wall to those walking past a piece of World War II history. To the more than three million soldiers that passed through Southampton, we salute you. The Friends of the Maritime Archaeology Trust are a group of volunteers whose aim is to help raise awareness of maritime archaeological heritage and to support the Maritime Archaeology Trust in safeguarding the resource for future generations to enjoy. 2020 was the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower, carrying pilgrims to the New World. Southampton was one of the ports the ship departed from, so with the help of funding from Southampton City Council's community chest, the Friends of the Trust had an idea to get people involved in creating a 3D annotated digital model of the Mayflower Memorial, so people could visit it from anywhere in the world and learn about this monumental event and the people whose plaques adorn the memorial in Southampton. The monument is also known as the Pilgrim Fathers Memorial because it commemorates the sailing of the Mayflower carrying English Puritans, who later became known as the Pilgrims, to Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620, where they set up the first permanent colony in New England. The pillar is Grade II listed and it was designed by local architect R. M. Lucas and built and erected in 1913 by local stonemasons and builders Garrett and Haysom. They also built many other structures in Southampton between 1806 and 1963. At the top of the stone stack there are pillars with carved semi-classical heads which raise a mosaic cupola. A copper model of the Mayflower sits on the top. It stands 50 feet high on Town Quay. Town Quay is the area from which the Mayflower left in August of 1620 to continue its journey to the New World. The pillar is made of Portland stone. Portland stone is a limestone and it's formed from the shells of tiny ocean dwelling creatures. It was formed in the late Jurassic period around 150 million years ago. At that time, the UK was situated in subtropical latitudes. This stone is also used to build St Paul's Cathedral and Buckingham Palace. Some of the still complete creatures can be observed in the stone. Photogrammetry can sometimes help bring these features out more clearly. As you can see here, there's a complete mollusk fossil present in the stone. The plaques that adorn the monument have been researched and these have been added, have been added to the model. More recently, the innovation of digital recording is transforming how people can access and view heritage. It's a way of digitally preserving objects before they're lost or damaged. It allows close-up views of objects or sites that might otherwise be difficult to access, as in this case, getting close up to the ship at the top of the memorial would be virtually impossible. Its versatility means it can be used for small objects, such as this gun flint from the shipwreck of the Earl of Abergavenny, or this gas light canister from the SS Camberwell, which was torpedoed during the First World War. It can be used for larger objects, such as vessels, uh, such as this seaplane lighter on the Hamble foreshore. Or it can be used over landscapes, such as this one over the lost village of Holesands in Devon. 
The models can be visited by anyone in the world, reaching people who might otherwise never have been aware of various important historical events. So creating an annotated 3D digital model of the monument can spread the story of the Mayflower further, allowing people from around the globe to visit the monument in Southampton without ever having to come to Southampton and to learn about the Mayflower story and also delve into the background of those whose names are present on the plaques. It might even inspire people to come to Southampton and see it for real. So where do we start? The first stage of the survey for the model is to capture photographs of the feature and we need the photographs to be from every angle so we can look all around it in our model. The photographs need to have at least 60% overlap and preferably 80% if possible to make sure that every point is seen twice. So there would be a 50% overlap of every Im image but as things are not always perfect 60% is a safer minimum but 80% is less likely to miss anything, so there's no holes in the data. Use the highest resolution and a fixed lens for the whole shoot, so no zooming in. Take more photographs rather than less. It's best to do it when the light is good, but not really when it's too sunny because this creates shadows. If it's a small object, then it can be done by a person holding the camera and moving around the object or with the object on a turntable. So what about larger objects? Well, you can move very slowly, taking the pictures around the object as you go. And when you get to the more out of, out of reach areas, the camera can be mounted on a pole. As you can see is happening here on the standing stone and passage grave in Brittany. Or as in this case, the camera was mounted on a pole to capture this vessel on the foreshore at East Winner after being uncovered following a storm. This Neolithic passage grave in Brittany was photographed moving slowly and gradually around it with the camera and using a scale at some point is good for processing the model. This is the resulting model. Move around the feature taking the overlapping photographs, also getting images from the top. If it's difficult to get to the top, mount the camera on a pole, as shown in the previous slide. It's also necessary to crawl into this type of feature to make sure you get the overlapping images for the inside to create the 3D model. You have to make sure that you get images from every aspect of the inside of the feature. Otherwise, you'll have gaps in your data and there'll be holes in the model. For larger structures or those that cannot be photographed in any other way, a drone can be used or a combination of both will also work. Such as this church in Brittany or to create the 3D annotated model of Hollybrook Memorial in Southampton. The end of 2019 and into 2020, when the project should have been happening, the memorial was shrouded in scaffolding, so a drone would not be able to get the required pictures. So permission was obtained to use the scaffolding to try to get some close up photographs to see if we could get enough photogrammetry that way to make the model while access was available to the whole monument. This proved too difficult to do with scaffolding poles everywhere. So the only way to capture the photos was to use a small, small drone when the scaffolding had been removed. The use of drones is regulated and in some cases permission has to be sought. The MAT used a small drone called the DJI Mavic Mini, which was classed as a toy until the 31st of December 2020, so no permission was needed. But after that date, permission would now be needed to fly within 50 metres of people or vehicles not under your control. So if using a drone, permissions for the particular one you're using need to be checked out. The drone survey was carried out for the Friends of the Trust by one of MAT's fully certified and insured drone pilots. It was planned to be an introduction and experience session for local volunteers, but with COVID restrictions, sadly, this was not possible. The survey has to be carefully planned and a survey pattern decided upon before the drone is launched. 
In the case of the Mayflower Monument, the survey pattern involved vertical lines from the base to the top from eight positions, face on to each side and facing each corner, so seeing part of each side. Also, three horizontal laps were flown around the top feature and the cupola, and also another three laps around the ship on the top from different heights. This was to ensure that the monument was fully captured and no part of it was missed. Once all the photographs have been collected, and there will be hundreds, if not thousands of them, depending on the size of the object or site, they are loaded into photogrammetry software to undertake the process of turning them into a model. There are many software packages, such as Reality Capture, Meshroom or Pix4D, along with many others. The software will detect feature points and match them, estimating the camera locations and 3D geometry. It will then generate a point cloud. It then creates a surface between the points and produces a continuous mesh over the surface of the model. So now it's created the model, but it needs texture added to it. The texture is generated from blending the original photographs together and then draping them across that surface, which is why it's so important to get the overlap when taking the photos so there's no holes where bits of the object might have been missed. This little statue was found on the steamship Sherala that sank during the First World War and the statue is now in Littlehampton Museum. But you can see the stages here where the point cloud is generated, the mesh surface is made and then the texture is finally added. This is a 3D model created from the Sherala. It was listed as a statue of a monkey, but being able to examine it closely all over, you can see that although it has the appearance, it's actually a hood that the woman's wearing that makes it look like that. This other probably unusual item for exploration is a toilet bowl from the SS Polo, which sank after being torpedoed in 1918. You can turn the model around to examine it and the maker's name is found inside. So you can get closer to a toilet to examine it than you might otherwise want to if you were researching this type of artefact. So back to the Mayflower Memorial. We now have a 3D model of the memorial developed, so we can now upload the model onto the interactive platform Sketchfab and add the information about the people on the plaques that the volunteers have researched. This will allow a detailed interactive exploration of the Mayflower Monument. This is a 3D digital model, which now includes an annotated tour of the monument. It is fully accessible online and can also be used as an educational resource or for research. The model has interpretation panels which pop up to let you explore the memorial by clicking on the plaques. This shows just some of the plaques and the information it gives. Many fascinating Mayflower passenger stories are told, such as Stephen Hopkins who was shipwrecked in his first attempt to sail to the New World. There are reasons for the various dedication plaques and the story of the pilgrims' relationship with the Native Americans with links to more about the Wampanoag. There's also information about Southampton's rich, diverse community and how it came to be. Links to more information to read the full extent of these stories complement the journey. Then the Mayflower ship itself and its journey through the Baltic before it carried the pilgrims to the New World. You can explore the model by going to maritimearchaeologytrust.org and you'll find it under projects and research or go to the Sketchfab website and search for Maritime Archaeology Trust where you'll find the models along with many others to explore. There's plenty more information and resources on 3D modelling on the web, but more specific information about 3D modelling in relation to heritage and the benefits of photogrammetry can be found on MAT's website. Historic England have put out a publication which is titled Photogrammetric Application for Cultural Heritage and is a guidance for good practice. This can be downloaded from Historic England's website. And the link to the rules on flying a drone can be found on the Civil Avi Aviation Authority's website. 
The Friends of the Maritime Archaeology Trust would like to thank Southampton City Council for the Community Chess Grant, which has made this model possible. And thanks to the volunteers who helped research the information to add to the production of this annotated digital 3D model. Hello everyone, my name is Brandon and I'm a Maritime Archaeologist with the Maritime Archaeology Trust. I've just got a few minutes to try to take you through some of the sites and features and assemblages that we've encountered over the last 12 to 13 months of work, focused on visualisation of these objects and materials as a really powerful way to communicate the significance and value of the material and our work uh, to as wide an audience as possible from stakeholders and curators to our colleagues in the field and of course to the general public so a lot to get through over the next few minutes i'm going to go through month by month starting with october 2020 when we assisted our colleagues at the nautical archaeology society with scanning small objects with our structured light scanner projecting an image uh, a pattern from a simple projector picking it up with an industrial black and white camera to create surfaces that we can use to start to build um, images uh, and records of um, small or even large objects here a gun flint from the Earl of Abergavenny and it renders in um, incredible detail with uh, percussion marks and reworking on the edges with a really nice color map that lends itself to producing highly realistic renders um, this one about three cent three by three and a half centimeters across that you can see on our sketchfab page sketchfab.com forward slash maritime archaeology trust along with all the other artifacts that we recorded for the NAS. November took us underwater with um, a kind of optimistic survey of Boldner Cliff in very dark conditions, but with some really great results. We tried out our new cameras that work in low light conditions and picked up some really remarkable timbers vertically driven into the seabed, probably 8,000, 8,100 years old, which you can see Heather having a really close look at here, annoying some local denizens in the process, while also uncovering some exquisitely preserved organic material. Gary's holding a, an oak leaf from a stratified deposit here, uh, and also making some incredible discoveries as the east-west action of the Solent erodes the cliff face at Boldner, 11 metres underwater, revealing flints falling onto the sand um, that had never been seen before, including this really nice flint core, possibly an adze, um, which my colleague Jasmine has made a, a wonderful model of as well, uh, using photogrammetry, revealing all of the retouch and working and the flaking of um, the, those blades from that object. Also on Sketchfab, December kept us busy with the D-Day wall visualisation, a project um, developed and um, taken forward by my colleague Helen Woolbridge. It's a wall in Southampton that preserves the names of veterans, US veterans, taking part in Operation Overlord over 70 years ago, um, scratching their names as they're waiting to embark on the wall into the bricks. They're still preserved and the research that's carried forward from that project, which Helen will be speaking more about has been really valuable and really well received so you can see that at dday maritime dot maritime archaeology trust dot org february to april kept us very busy with another visualization this time of the chesil cannon sites chesil beach cannon sites two collections of guns a project we worked with the nautical archaeology society and a team of local custodians and volunteers who are going to take forward the protection, uh, monitoring and investigation of these important assemblages. Very, very large guns. These ones close inshore at the inshore site um, with associated very large concretions, tons of cannonballs coming out of there, um, complete guns as well as um, broken uh, fragments. So not entirely sure what the site formation process there is uh, and also taking us off to the outer site the offshore site where you can see the auto, auto mosaic here um, which is fully scaled this was recorded in uh, January 
uh, attempted to record in January uh, and then successfully in uh, August last year. So you can really start to find out about the previous work and have a look at that at chesil.maritimearchaeologytrust.org. On to the Mayflower drone survey with a suspicious individual flying a drone in the corner and recording the Mayflower monument and uh, all of the aspects as part of uh, my colleague Jan's project to visualize and research this monument um, commemorating the voyage of the Mayflower in the 1620s. So tons to see here again. You can find this model on Sketchfab and um, we also have quite a nice visualization of the of the ship uh, on top of the monument as well which is uh, surviving um, remarkably well over the last hundred years or so. June was a very busy month for field work and we had an opportunity to revisit uh, the sailing vessel Brackenholm, the train set wreck that Dave Wendes, local maritime historian, has been researching over a number of years. We've um, not been able over the previous season to build on the 3D model that we've started to develop, but we've still got some useful images anyway, showing the condition of the large axles and wheels, as well as the uh, steam tubes from the uh, boiler of the steam train, steam trains themselves that were on their way to Belgium in the 1860s um, when the ship was lost in collision with a naval vessel. So um, hopefully we'll be able to expand on this and tell some more of the story, not just of the cargo, but of the ship that's also appears to be preserved under this assemblage. On the way back in, we had a chance to see SS War Knight just off the back of the Isle of Wight in Sandown Bay in a lot more detail than we're usually able to view this wreck in. It's remarkable for its uh, steam turbine engines and we can see Gary here taking some photos and beginning to map a much wider area, taking in the prop shaft tunnel uh, as well as um, much larger areas of the stern. So we hope to be able to present that in a future update. And um, one of Dave Wenders' divers, Phil Alcock, also recovered um, when they had remarkable visibility, this brass nameplate of one of the crew's um, uh, chests, sea chests. And we've got George Tucker here. So research on this is ongoing by Mr. Wenders, and we'll look forward to hearing more about that soon. So it's not just research projects that we're involved in, but also offshore commercial projects keep us very busy. And while we're not quite ready to make any uh, big announcements on some of the material that we've been looking at from a range of developments, uh, national infrastructure projects, I am able to just show you a few images um, by way of hinting at some of the publications that are going to be forthcoming. So we've got champagne bottles, a very rare anchor and um, also in structured light, um, this really nice onion bottle. I just wanted to squeeze in there. So lots to talk about um, from the commercial world, but um, that's all to, to come in a future update. Other deep water investigations of Scotland have uh, provided an opportunity to learn more about a First World War shipwreck, one that we thought was the first Norwegian casualty of the First World War, SS Svein Jarl, that was sunk by a torpedo in 1915. Um, here we're seeing a, a vessel in 90 metres of water, remarkably preserved, and um, this imagery is collected by ROV using ROV mounted multi-beam. It's a point cloud, it's incredibly dense and detailed, and it allows us to get a really good view of the damage it's caused by the torpedo in the port side. Um, we thought confirming the identity of SS Svein Jarl, a view of the engines and even the helm uh, as we come around the stern to view the cargo holds up to the bow. But here at the bow was the crucial bit of evidence actually that really um, nailed the identity of this vessel. And it wasn't Svein Jarl uh, after all. Preserved on that starboard side, you can just make out the letters perhaps. We have a T just here, an R, two letters missing or obscured, and then an O at the end. And one of three candidates we had for this vessel based on its length and propulsion type within a 50 kilometer area was SS Truro, 
also sunk in 1915, just a few short weeks after the loss of uh, Spain Yar. Um, so this one was actually almost 50 kilometers away in its reported position from where we identified the actual wreck on the seabed. So really nice to be able to um, accurately position and identify this vessel as part of this project. August and September, we returned to Boldner Cliff. Um, so we had some great visibility at this time and were able to capture both BC2, where we have the large assemblages of flints, as you can see, eroding out from the peat in this image, um, with these great chunks of peat falling onto the seabed. And this is where we find literally hundreds, if not thousands of flint um, scatters. And then BC5, which was a real achievement, Gary and Kristen in um, uh, about, eight meters of visibility, we're able to record this 55 meter length section of building the cliff, never seen before in a single model. Uh, you can see all of the embayments and all of the um, peak caps coming out here, preserving some really wonderful archeology. span So we've got the plan view uh, aligned to north there, and then closing up on uh, tree stumps, of which there are just so many. This was dry land uh, at, uh, the end of the last ice age and we've got this kind of cliff area leading down to well the Solent would have been a freshwater lake at this time uh, and there's lots of interesting features overlapping timbers forming trackways a vertical timbers embedded uh, into the into the sediment and then these incredible promontories and projections of uh, fallen trees and tree stumps interspersed with lots of human material so that's just gone into Sketchfab I invite you to have a look. So that brings us up to October 2021. Uh, looking beyond to new discoveries and new collaborations, and we've even been out on site in the last few days working with uh, new partners on some very exciting things that we're really looking forward to telling you about in the coming months. It's going to be another very busy year. Looking forward to resuming our work with our partners in the Mediterranean, on the Atlantic coast as well, as well as in Africa and the Middle East. 3D survey, recording and visualisation is a, an increasingly important and valuable approach to understanding underwater cultural heritage, but also for communicating its value and enjoyment in ways that have not been previously possible or perhaps accessible. We're really excited to tell you more about some of the sites we've briefly covered today. So for now, it just remains for me to thank you for your time and looking forward to seeing you in the next update. This is Gary Momber. I'm the director of the Maritime Archaeology Trust. And today I'll be talking about some of the work over the last year on the submerged landscapes of the Solent. I'll also be looking at the research by the Trust over the past 30 years and share where we can realise added value from the maritime archaeological resource to the understanding of our history and the coastline. I'll begin by showing you some of the places we'll visit in the short tour. We'll be going up to the River Itchen in the north and looking at Southampton Water in the River Test. Uh, to the east of Cowes, we'll pop to see Wooden Core. We'll then go along the northwest Solent around by Culshot, uh, the Beaulieu Estate, Limington River, but I will begin at our favourite site, being Boldner Cliff. At Boldner Cliff, we have the remnants of a submerged landscape that stretches for a kilometre east and west. It's eroding away towards the Isle of Wight, and as it's doing so, it's revealing exposed tree stumps, a nice cliff edge, and also these fluval outcrops which are the remnants of old stream systems. At the pop, top of the picture you can see in front of you in the green, the top area is peat, and it's underneath the peat that this, these areas, this old land surface is protected. And this is the area that's eroding away. We have the natural environment, but we also have archeological material, very significant archeological material. WF2, which is a wood feature two on the right hand side, is where we found the remnants of boat building activity believed to be the oldest boat building site in the world at 8,000 years old. Whereas WF4 and WF5 are old platforms that are made up of the remnants of the material that were produced as part of the boat building activity. And we can see one of the platforms, WF4, at the bottom of the image here, which is made up of 60 pieces of worked wood. 
This is a very significant site and in particular because the wood collection that we've recovered from the site has pretty much doubled the whole collection for the nation for the whole Mesolithic period, a period that lasted uh, for about four and a half thousand years. In addition, a lot of work has been conducted on the site to analyse the sediments and the archaeology. This has been with the help of Historic England in the past, the University of York, the University of Southampton. And this particular slide represents work with the University of Warwick and the University of Bradford, where we're looking at cedar DNA, that sedimentary DNA from the site. This revealed a lot of flora and fauna. It revealed oryx, dogs or wolves, uh, probably dogs, uh, rodents, uh, there's uh, oak, pine, apple tree, and various herbs as well. But most significantly, we found einkorn, and this is corn, and this is 8,000 years old, and it's turned up in the UK 2,000 years before it was believed to do so, and 2,000 years before any other site in the British Isles. The significance of the site has been rec recognised internationally. There's been about 20, 25 publications around it, and there's been exhibitions uh, by the heritage agencies in both Flanders uh, and the Netherlands. In the UK, we have a display at the Shipwreck Centre at Maritime Museum at Arreton Barnes on the Isle of Wight. This is alongside Martin Woodward's wonderful collection of artefacts from the many shipwrecks that wrecked off the shores. The Boldner Cliff collection is particularly significant because it's the only one of its kind in the UK and it tells a story of human movement, migration and possible sedentism 8,000 years ago at a time when Britain was first being separated from mainland Europe. The archaeological, paleoenvironmental and DNA evidence from the site has enabled this terrific reconstruction by Mike Greaves. In the background you see, can see the cow-like auric. In the foreground you have the hunter with his wolf-like dog. On the right-hand side you see some boat building activity for which we have lots of evidence. And around the centre you can see someone who appears to be making food. They have the beef, they have the bread, they have the herbs as well. So it looks like not only is this the oldest boat building site in the world, but it's the oldest site with potential evidence of people making beef burgers. Notwithstanding the cultural value of the material that we find below the waterline, it can also tell us about past sea level rise. And this was first identified by Isle of Wight archaeologist Dr David Tomlin back in the 1980s. When he looked at the foreshore at Wooden Core, as you see on the top left hand side here, and he noticed that as you walk down the beach, effectively you're walking back in time. Everything gets older and older until you end up with the Neolithic forest, as you see on the right hand side, one of the trees from that forest, dating back over 3000 years. So if you can date those different archaeological artifacts and paleo paleoenvironmental artefacts going up the beach, you can monitor where sea level was at a certain period of time. Not only that, you can extend that underwater, as you can see in the bottom image, where there are also peat deposits and submerged landscapes, just as we saw at Boldner Cliff, that can be dated. Looking north to the River Itchen, members of the Trust were out on the foreshore at dawn at low water in the 1990s, looking for archaeological evidence and we came across a prehistoric forest about 9,000 years old. This has only been exposed because sediments have been washed from above it, and now it's probably lost. Around the corner on the river test, there was some more clear archaeological evidence. These were split timbers. They were Bronze Age, over 3,000 years old, coming out of the land surface, and they were part of a collection of seven different trackways. The reason for the exposure of these timbers, which have all now been lost, is yet to be confirmed. Some people blame it on climate change. But then, if we look around at the local development, I think there could be other reasons. This process of erosion continues underwater as well. And we can see it by looking at some of the map regression and survey data we've collected. If we look at the top left hand chart, we have the mud flats as they were in 1781 presented by Murdoch Mackenzie. On the right hand side you see the regression of the mudflats 200 years later. 
On the left, you have it at three quarter high water mark. On the right hand side, you have what's left at low water mark. And in the bottom left hand corner, you have a survey over that area where the mudflats used to be as represented by the Murdoch McKenzie chart. And you can see the hatched areas within the sort of straight boxes represent areas of peat deposit underwater. And we know that because we've dived underwater and we've seen the peat deposit. We've also seen how it's eroding away. And the picture on the right hand side is an old land surface dated at over 6,000 years old. It was once underneath the mudflats as represented by Murdoch Mackenzie. It's now well out past low watermark into the Zolent, Solent as represented on the more recent chart from 1991. The peat deposit we just looked at on the northern side of the Solent corresponds nicely with the upper peat deposit you see in the left-hand schematic back at Boulder Cliff. It's in about four metres of water and dates to the same period. This schematic was produced as part of a European life project that we were looking at back in 1997-1999 to try and understand coastal formation rather than archaeology per se. But what we did discover when we dropped down through the depths of the Solent and the bottom right hand side here was the edge of, edge of this underlying peat pl platform that was eroding away and was just being defended by these sort of old trees and tree root systems and tree stumps. As archaeologists, however, we were more concerned about what we might find there, what remnants of human activity from 8000 years ago. And so we were quite pleased when the coastline was sort of eroding away a little bit. And with the help of these lobsters here, this particular one, they were excavating lots and lots of flints from this nice sandy deposit below these big oak trees and making us all very excited. And once we found the first flint from the first such site of its kind in the UK, we kept revisiting the area and we we're finding more and more very finely worked flints. And we also discovered immaculately preserved organic artifacts and ecofacts like these leaves from the site. They're all 8,000 years old. A couple of oak leaves on the left found a few years ago. And on the right here we have laurel, we have alder and oak all recovered last summer. It looks like you could have picked them up from the forest floor, but they actually came from deep within the site that's over 8,000 years old. I mentioned from the outset, the bowl in the cliff was of international importance and as such we've managed to incorporate it into our international EU projects, a number of them over the last 10 or 15 years. It's also been used as an exemplar that's been put forward to help demonstrate the value and significance of the underwater heritage in such documents as Land Beneath the Waves, the EU Marine Board Position Paper in 2014. And this is an area that we were pushing forward with the site until recently. What we now recognise that this site, along with many other coastal archaeological sites, demonstrate irreversible change. And this is something that we're looking at within our EU Sustainable and Resilient Coastal Change project that's ongoing at the moment, where we're using the archaeology and the paleo environmental resource to help identify long-term patterns of change and how it's affected the coastline. So one of the first things we have to do is visualise the site, enable people to see it, which is difficult when it's 11 metres down under the murky waters of the Solent. So we've employed photogrammetric techniques by recording it one little piece at a time. This is a 55 metre stretch of the submerged landscape on the edge of the cliff where it's eroding away and it's taken with about 2,000 photographs. These have been stitched together to form a 3D model and so when you turn it at different angles you can get a better feel of what's actually happening to the site. On the right, you can see the remnants of an old tree. It's a root systems. And you have smaller trees 
all the way up as you travel up to the top left hand corner. And in between these trees, which act as a bit of defence against the sea, you get embayments. And within the embayments, this is where we're finding some of the archaeological material. A nice example is this platform we found eroding from the edge of the cliff in 2016. It's nice and flat on one side and laid out in an orderly fashion. 400 metres to the east, we have another area where there's quite active erosion. This is 20 metres wide, but as you can see from the centre and the middle on the right, there's a lot of lumps and bumps of clay, and these have collapsed down from the cliff above. The top image is a plan view, and the bottom image is looking into the side of it, and the area of interest is right to the, on the right-hand side of the centre. In amongst the tumbling down blocks of clay, we also have sand, and then within the sand, we have nice flint artefacts. And in front of you here, you can see a tranche axe, or type of adze, the sort of tool that would have been used for working with wood to hollow out a log for a log boat. And this tranche axe is only one of over 400 pieces of worked flint that we discovered that had fallen out of this eroding section of Boulder Cliff during the course of the last year. At the bottom of the screen here, you can see the distribution relative to the areas from which they came. And there's a higher concentration of flints around the middle of that site, which we think is probably the uh, epicenter of activity at this location. Returning to the surface in the intertidal zone, we still see some large expanses of mudflats remaining around Limington, but this is at low water. And when you go further out under the water, a lot of those mudflats are eroded and you come to those exposed land surfaces we noted earlier. A few miles further east, all the mudflats have gone and you're left with a pre-inundation land surface that's covered with the occasional gravel sandbar and cut through with paleo channels that exit from the land to the right. Within and on the side of these old paleo channels, we're finding the remnants of old submerged forests. This one here of the Beulah estate goes back over 5,000 years and has just recently been exposed. We've also found archaeological evidence from the same landscape. This dates to the same sort of period, just maybe slightly earlier, but it's a post, a post that's been worked and covered with some sort of resin, probably to protect it for the ingress to sea level. These sites were found about four metres below the current high tides. The area continued to be occupied, and this structure dates to the Bronze Age about three and a half thousand years ago. It's not very robust, so it would have to have been built in a sheltered environment or protected by mudflats. It was only found a couple of years ago, and even within that time, about a third of the structure has been lost, showing how vulnerable these features are. Five miles further east still, there's yet another Bronze Age structure, just under three and a half thousand years old. This is much larger, much more complicated, built by robust timbers. This is also eroding away, but you can see what remains below the surface, for a while that is. On the right hand side, you can still see the cut marks from the bronze tools that made these timbers. Nearby, we have another dated feature, this time a Roman causeway that would have been cutting across the marsh, probably over one of the paleo channels. The levels of pres preservation here are quite exquisite because they're buried beneath the silt but all those elements that are above the silt tend to get eroded away quite quickly. This can be seen with some nearby Roman posts from a couple of hundred years later that have been degrading quickly. But if we can work out their function and their relationship with the sea level at the time they were built, we can use them to help calculate the past rate and pace of sea level change. The sites we've just been looking at cover a period of over 8,000 years. When they were built, they were on coastlines that were fit for their purpose. All these landscapes have since changed. Indeed, this is an ongoing process and the impact can be seen in the partial collapse of Hurst Castle in February 2021. Such events are not random, but they're consequences of cause and effect. If we can identify the cause and effect, we can predict where the next event would happen. 
To understand coastal change, we can draw lessons from the past, as these are the foundations upon which the future will unfold. Maritime archaeology does not have all the answers, but it's a useful tool that can be pulled from the box when necessary. Looking at her spit from the air, we see a feature that was created as the sea level rose over thousands of years. It was always a natural guardian of the solient, but today it needs help. Could the modern threats be all down to climate change? Or like the exposed prehistoric landscapes along the River Test, could humans have something to do with it? Having spent the last 15 minutes looking at the submerged cultural heritage of the Solent, I think we can conclude that it is more than just maritime archaeology. First, it can help us understand the cultural foundations upon which our maritime society is built. Secondly, it can help unravel long-term patterns of coastal change. Thirdly, it can help quantify the vulnerable maritime heritage. And finally, it can pinpoint current threats to the coastline, which I think will be of most interest to those that live along the Solent shores. And finally, a big thank you to all our staff, volunteers, chairmen, trustees, patrons, presidents and vice presidents who have supported us through this trying year and made everything such a great success.